Uh, let's get going then. Um, welcome to the October 2021 uh, meeting of the Racial Disparities Advisory Panel. Uh, I'd like to begin, as always, with introductions. Uh, I will go through the list that I have on the side of my screen and hopefully get everyone. Uh, Sheila, can you start us off, please? Yes, hello, everybody. This is Sheila. I'm in the 508 number. Sheila, she, her pronouns, calling out of Brattleboro, Vermont, appointed um, by Attorney General and representing the Root Social Justice Center. Thank you. Robin. Hi, this is Robin Joy on the phone, Director of Research, Crime Research Group. Great. Abigail Crocker. Hi, this is Abby Crocker. I'm at the University of Vermont and also the National Center on Restorative Justice. Great. Tyler. Good evening, everyone. Tyler Allen. I'm the Adolescent Services Director for uh, the Department of Children and Families. Great. Uh, Crime Research Group admin. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, that might be what I'm at. This is Christopher Loris, a research associate with Crime Research Group. Ah, okay, thanks. Susanna. Hello, Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director for the state. Great. Judge Grierson. You're muted. Some would say that's a good idea, Aton. <laughs> Um, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge. Good evening, everyone. Good to see you. Oh, hi. Ian. Hi, uh, Ian Loris, Aton's note taker. Great. Karen. Hi, everyone. Karen Gannett, Crime Research Group. Great. Loretta Saki, please. Hi, everyone. Loretta Saki, Paul. Um, Policy Analyst for Council State Government's Justice Center. Thank you. Great. Mark Hughes. Hey, everybody. It's Mark. I am with the Racial Justice Alliance. Thanks, Mark. Evan. Good evening, everyone. My name is Evan Meenan, and I work for the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Great. Representative Lalonde. Uh, hello, everybody. Martin Lalonde, uh, and I am representative on the House Judiciary Committee. Thanks. Alana Tate. Hi, I'm Alana Tate. I am the Compliance Monitor with DCF. Thank you. Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Uh, Rebecca Turner from um, the Office of the Defender Generals. Monica Weber. Good evening, everyone. I'm Monica Weber, and I'm here representing the Department of Corrections. Great. And Judge Zone. Hi, Tom Zone. I am, I think the official title is Chief Superior Judge in Training <laughs> for a few more weeks. Great. Thank you. And welcome to all. Have I forgotten anyone? Yes, I can see someone who's just come in. Jennifer. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I'm having some technical issues tonight. Uh, this is Jen Furpo representing the Vermont Police Academy. Great. Anyone who's been missed? Julio, I didn't call your name. Oh, my. Well, we carry on. Uh, announcements. Does anyone have any? I The only one I have is what Rebecca told me, that Jess Brown is unavoidably detained and will be in as soon as she can be. Um, anything else from anyone? Okay, seeing no hands, moving on to the next item. Approval of the minutes of our last meeting. 
discussion, corrections, addenda, errata, etc. Eitan, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Okay. Y'all know the drill. A motion I'll has been I'll made. second. It has been seconded. Fine. All in favor of approving the minutes as submitted, please say aye or raise your hand. Aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. All abstentions. Minutes she are accepted. Abstaining. I'm sorry. Um, I wasn't at the last meeting, so I'm abstaining. OK, one abstention. Ian, if you would note that, please. Um, however, yes, the motion does carry and the minutes are approved as as written and as submitted. Moving on now to uh, the main body of the evening, which is the report that we are preparing for submission on the 15th of November. Um, you all should know that, uh, well, you have seen it, that the working group has been just doing yeoman's work, in my opinion, at least, um, and that work is represented on SharePoint. The link to the folder which contains all of that work has been sent to all of you. Um, you have been able to look at it. Um, I ask that you take a look, particularly at the draft, which was the first uh, file on the, in that folder labeled, uh, well, I don't remember the entire title, but it was certainly began with 01 Act 65 draft report, I believe, with the date 9-27-21, if my memory serves, which who the hell knows. Um, in any event, I was hoping as I wrote you with that note that you would now have taken a look at that between that re your receipt of that note and now. Um, there are some big questions that we need to put before you and get feedback from you all on um, so that when we go back to work on Monday next, we have some direction from the full body. Uh, there will be one more, I believe, meeting before the report is submitted. And let me also be clear, that one meeting is within 48 hours of when the report needs to be submitted. I'm not pulling an all-nighter. I'm just letting you know that now. I'm not doing it. I don't mind copy editing. I love doing that. I live for this. But no last minute, oh, we need 16 appendices. No, the time for that is now. Um, we need to be clear about what we need as soon as possible. The other reason for that is you will know and you'll remember um, that there will be a moment when we will be working with legislative council. So there really won't be a lot of time for last minute major rewrites. Um, and that's partly why we have this set up the way we do now is uh, let's do the rewrites now. Um, there were a lot of discussions last night, which I will let other people um, relate. Um, I will begin just by saying that there are two main issues that came out of last night's discussion. Um, you should know that that meeting was really dedicated, at least in my mind, f to get the working group all on the same page so that they could present a, a case to all of you this evening. Um, the two issues that were largest were still the situ where the, this body would be situated. That is still, as and you will all remember, this has been a major issue since we came up with this, um, if not the most major issue. Um, 
The second concerned the connections between the governing body that is mentioned in the draft and the executive director of the data entity. Um, is the word that is used is govern in the draft. There has been discussion as to whether it should be inform, whether it should be advise, and those all have very different valences and definitions, which you can be appreciative of. Um, but those are important. Um, it's one of those rare instances where that one word actually has a tremendous amount of import. Um, so that's another issue, but it also because it has to do with the relationship of this governing body that we have all proposed to the staff of the, the data entity itself. Um, the last issue, I guess, would have to do Rebecca, I would have you frame that for us, if you could. It was, you were, you raised it very nicely last night. I think you felt like you were being a pain in the neck and I didn't. I thought you were just being very clear about um, basically questions four and five from Act 65 and the document that has been written and is in the folder in regard to the data integration plan. Can I ask you to weigh in on that, please? Um, sure. Well, um, although others from last night should jump in. Um, sure. Please. But I think, as Aton said, we spent most of the night um, processing the contributions from Karen, Robin, Witchy, I think, Monica, I don't know if you were involved. Um, who did uh, the heavy lifting leading up to our meeting last night on those sections. And really it's it's the nuts and bolts. How will this actually work? Um, and, and, and again, addressing questions three, four from Act 65 specifically. Um, and so what I understood was the uh, where the work was drawn from, what you'll see here, but particularly, I think it's the second document in the SharePoint uh, which mm -hmm. is pulling from um, uh, what's the organization? It's been a long uh, time. NC Karen NCJRP. NCJRP, yeah. and and to spell it out for for everyone here who may not be familiar. Yep. Uh, the National Criminal Justice Reform Project. And as I understand, it's it's a parallel effort that that committee, a separate committee made up of some overlapping panel members, um, but government stakeholders. So DOC, um, state's attorney's office, the defender general's office is on there. Sort of this, this general committee relating to this um, NCJRP, uh, but that there was a sort of a focused project on data aggregation of, um, criminal justice data, sort of in parallel. Data integration, not aggregation, integration. Integration, integration. Um, in parallel to what we were working on. And so Karen shared a draft of how that group had been um, working towards conceptualizing the structure of how, again, how to integrate these various data sets from, from different uh, government offices and agencies. Again, I think our, my understanding was that it was from the criminal justice system, specifically not the juvenile justice system. Um, so the concerns there, it, it's its a sketch, you see it on the SharePoint. My, I think what Aitan is asking me to highlight here now is the concerns seem to be creating a, a governing structure within sort of the bigger structure. So what Aitan just showed you, we, we're talking about where to situate the entity but the governing board's interaction with permanent staff, and then this separate structure of governance concerning the integration of the various sources of data from the different government agencies. And the proposal there came from um, some 
some guidance from, again, I don't know where Mo West is from, what organization, Arnold Ventures and Search specifically, which my concern was that that's a, that it is not approaching this process from the same place that the AISP toolkit is um, approaching it, which has been guiding our work. AISP is um, actionable intelligence social policy out of yeah. UPenn, and they produced a, a useful toolkit that's been guiding us throughout the summer on how to ground data integration um, work and projects from a racial equity perspective, how to integrate concerns of racial equity throughout, not just sort of that sort of this level of community input at one point, but throughout all the stages of the data integration work. So the, the concern was, was when we overlaid and, and Karen brought this work in from, from that committee, that was not the same place that that work had been done. So that was it. And also the fact that um, we didn't know a lot about what was going on through that process, whose voices were part of that planning process. That was my concern uh, that the Defender General's office had not um, been participatory in that process. So it was just um highlighting sort of the newness and and just sort of learning about what those governing structures were about how that worked with what we were proposing within the AIS, AISP toolkit framework thank you so on that note Eitan can I add something to that please do Karen so I was reviewing some of the AISP work and in particular the toolkit, but also one of the, the previous documents that AISP put together, it's called, it's actually referenced in the toolkit, and it's called Introduction to Data Sharing and Integration. And there's a link in the toolkit, it's one of the first pages, I can't remember which one, it might be page one or page two. And in that document, it really goes through, and I don't, Robin and I aren't wedded to to you putting the NCJRP work in the report. We're not wedded to that, but that is, and I think um, Julio made this comment last night, that that is some of the foundational work that has to happen. And in this AISP introduction to data sharing and integration, they actually go through the same steps prior to doing the racial equity lens. So I just wanted to point that out that the steps for data sharing and data integration are somewhat similar across the board. You have to set the table before you can do some of the other work that needs to be done. So that might be something that people want to look at as well, just to see the parallels there. Great. Thank you, and Karen. Eitan, can I just add one quick Please. thing? That yes. Rebecca, when I went through the, um, this is Robin, by the way. Uh, when I went through the um, toolkit again and, in, and the um, uh, data integration plan that was submitted to Arnold Ventures, um, the one thing that was missing and that I put in that data document is that, you know what, you're right, we have no community members on here. At one point, I think that the CJCs were more involved in this than they are now, um, but that was the closest we got. And so... Um, recognizing that in the fund, in the request for funding process, um, there were no community members involved in that request for funding um, via this project. I, you know, added in that document that we should um, add community members, regardless of what what RDAP does. We we, we really should add community members. Um, that it didn't come out of a racial equity lens is like half true. Um, Part of the reason why we got here is because they were pushing a tool that they said was um, racially um, neutral um, and that wasn't going to have disparate impact on people of color. And I said, I don't believe you. And so I'm going to test that. And so we're still testing that. That's how we know that we didn't actually have a really big um, uh, failure to appear problem. So a few meetings ago, somewhere you and I were exchanging numbers on how many people failure to appear. So we're still working on that study, um, but that's where we pivoted um, because it, that tool probably isn't racially neutral as they claim and doesn't work for Vermont anyways. So that's all. Great, thank you. 
that all sounds extremely technical. <laughs> and this is where we're at right now. All of you who are not regular participants in the working group, this is where we're at right now. Um, this is the moment where I'm hoping, I mean, my fantasy is that all of you who need to have, I mean, I know that the SharePoint link has been sent out to everyone. Um, I did that in concert with Ann Walker of the Attorney General's office. Um, so I know that's been out. I know my note went out. Um, and this would be the point where conversation about what works for you and what doesn't work for you happens. I would remind you of two points. When I wrote that note, the one I did reference my time in the 80s with the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. And I noted in that that people didn't at that time get to make criticisms without also being willing to construct something. It's really easy to tear things apart. It's not quite as easy to tear them apart and build them back up. That meant in ACT UP, if you weren't willing to participate in solu solutions, you didn't get to talk about the problem. So I want to remind you that that might be a way that's operating, because if you don't work on the solution, you're expecting other people, co-panelists, to pick up the labor for you. And I don't think that's particularly right. Um, the second thing would be, don't get caught up on the wordsmithing. We are nowhere near that yet. Um, and also remember, um, as I wrote in that note, this is not going to be remembrance of things past, right? It's, it's really not. It's a legislative report. It's not supposed to read beautifully. That's not the point. It's just supposed to convey information. On that, Evan, please, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eitan. I just, I just wanted to briefly um, take a moment and identify two things about the five questions that we're supposed to be answering that I think we spent a lot of time discussing and did make some progress on that may not be fully captured in the written materials on that SharePoint site. Um, the first one is question number five, which deals with the best methods for the Bureau to enforce its data collection and analysis responsibilities. I think that the documents on the SharePoint site do a good job of, of, of trying to frame out how the data collection and analysis should happen but we didn't really make tons of progress on the enforcement piece. In other words, what happens if there's an entity that has data that should be reported that chooses for one reason or another simply not to report it? What would be the ramifications for that decision? And we didn't really, um, I, at least in my mind or my recollection, did not come up with a, a tentative proposal to answer that question. So that no, would be something right, for a discussion. Evan. And then the second thing I wanted to flag related to the first question we're supposed to answer, which is where the Bureau should be situated. And we didn't come up with a single recommendation, the working group did not come up with a single recommendation for the entirety of RDAP to consider. But what I think we did do was make some significant process progress by identifying three potential homes. Um, the, the first one uh, was um, some sort of newly constituted version of the Office of uh, Racial Equity, um, which already has some statutory obligations to collect data. Um, and, and the documents relevant to that idea would be um, the third and fourth documents on that SharePoint site. But there was also two other entities that were identified that could be suitable homes. The first was the Secretary of State's office. And um, the third was the auditor's office. Um, and, and now speaking on behalf of the department as, a, as opposed to trying to report back from the working group, um, you know, any three of those entities probably could get this job done and, and get it done well. 
um, but they should probably be consulted by the legislature in some more detail to figure out exactly what their existing capabilities are. And some type of asset slash financial study should be conducted to determine how easily each of those three entities could absorb this additional work. So I, I at least think it would be reasonable to lay out those three entities in a report and the pros and cons and the additional work that needed would need to be conducted in order to finalize a selection as opposed to RDAP having, you know, either this meeting or next meeting come up with uh, some sort of agreed upon home. Thank you. The other thing I would add there, thank Evan, by the way, thank you, because like I'm obviously scattered. Um, the other thing I would add, and Robin, you may want to weigh in on this. I remember you saying, um, and it, it's just coming to me in the last half hour, that the one problem with the Secretary of State is that they don't have the data agreements. Is that correct? Um, I don't recall saying that, but that would be okay, true. Okay, never think. mind. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think that um, what we had talked about in the working group is that the whole structure, right, of um, what, who you hire, what they're going to look, what it's going to look like. Um, it's it's dramatically different if it's in the agency of administration versus one of the other. It, it's just different. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, but you. right now, you know, the age, the office, any agency, right, and no matter where you put it, those data sharing agreements and the MOUs are going to have to happen. So, so there's no preference that way for one Good. office or another. Thank you. Thank yep. you. That's what I needed. Thank you, Rebecca. Your hand is up. Yes. Um, to expand upon Evan's point. Um, those organizations we talked about and and we talked about it specifically in the context of of overarching um, agreement, overarching principles of agreement that we wanted the entity, no matter where it was placed to be. Right. And, and we have talked a lot as a group, the importance of independence, other words that were, were thrown out that were critical, that we recognize was critical to the success of, of its mission is that it be have integrity, that, that the work that it produces can be trusted and acted upon, right? So what does it mean to have integrity? You know, there's a lot of built-in um, ideas to unpackage there, right? Um, you know, transparency, uh, accountability, best practices, standards. Uh, other, another big pulling back to a high level principles we wanted the data entity to have or encompass was impartiality. Um, again, separate from independence, uh, related but separate. And key to that is to make sure that it's not linked to any, you know, to public safety, to law enforcement, uh, to corrections, right, to any particular government entity, again, which overlaps with the principle of integrity, uh, that we want uh, not just, and I, I stressed it, the importance of being able to rely on the work, but also critically important that we recognized in this working group was to protect the individuals who comprise the data, right? And so it is not also just an issue of privacy and considering confidentiality laws and all of that but it is also back to what is the purpose driving this um, entity itself. It is not just a statistical cold machine, right? And, and, and I don't mean that to say, what, I, you know, we don't understand what the data means and, and that it means it, it comprises human beings and human lives, but specifically in the context of our work, which is addressing, understanding, addressing, correcting, racial inequities in these criminal juvenile justice systems recognize as we have recognized previously that they are built upon and continue to operate within a system of white supremacy, right? And so how that comes into these general pullback high level principles of impartiality, integrity, right? Independence is, is a sense of protection of the people and the individuals whose 
uh, perspectives are captured by the data themselves. So that in, in, in a way, in a reading, rereading the AISP toolkit that's built into it, um, built into it to such a degree that it's not just having the representation from these communities and individuals of lived experiences at a certain board, but that it's 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 a it's a principle that's got, goes into every step of the way, choosing the algorithms, choosing what data to put on a dashboard. How can this dash the information be used as a weapon? Because that's not the goal of the of people who comprise the data. Instead, it's the affirmative use, right? How do we use it? Again, we're trying to build trust and relations uh, with people and, and to understand, again, that this isn't a law enforcement, public safety oriented uh, mission. Again, back to the impartiality. I would just point out in terms of, of Secretary of State's office here, I, I, I do, I did reach out uh, to uh, Jim Condos and he is, I understand talking as he's aware of this. He's aware that, that this office has been recommended and, and they're discussing um, the feasibility of it. Um, and so just sort of bringing them in the loop. I wanted to add that I think their objectivity is, is, a, is a pro. Uh, I know it was sort of discussed here sort of as a con, perhaps in their lack of familiarity with, with MOUs, with, with these court systems. I actually think it's an advantage uh, similar to the recommendation of the auditor's office, getting that objectivity, um, the expertise that's built into those two organizations, expertise on the level of, of um, you know, best practices, compliance protections, uh, the laws in place. Um, they're just a resource. A resource. Okay. You finished? I, I wasn't sure, Rebecca. You yeah, no, I'm finished. Okay, okay. I didn't want to cut you off, and it the computer made it sound like suddenly you cut out. So, uh, anyone else? This is a good point. I, I well, there's one thing actually I do want to add, um, and I haven't been able to get to it yet, and I need to make a public apology. Um, Sheila passed on some interesting criticisms. Um, and I have not been able to incorporate them into the draft yet. I just simply have not had time. One of them had to do with the namings of the different groups that would be included within the governing body. Um, Sheila, I don't want to put words into your mouth. Do you want to take over from here? I mean, I'll do it if yeah, you well, want. Yeah, sure. Sure, if you can help me, if I forget anything that I um, wrote to you, please let me know. Okay, but one of the, you go. One of, the things, one of the things that I brought up was we talked about the governing body. I really appreciate everybody talking about that governing and that word and what we're going to call that because it does mean different things and I think has different quote unquote teeth or power. And so I wonder when we talk about community, we, we do a lot of broad sort of scope of who we're talking about but then when we get into the nitty-gritty we're just like oh community partners but are those community partners actually people who are supporting people who are most impacted by what we're seeking to do are those community partners in favor are they like we don't we're not explicit about who is at the table we just have a broad stroke except for community partners and then we're very more specific when we were naming like state entity people or people that we want but a little less broad in the community and I think that we need to have it fluid and open but I also don't want to set us up to be like anybody can be sitting at that table who might be adversarial to what we're trying to do to dismantle the white supremacy in the system that we're doing so I want to be mindful of that moving forward I also had a lot of criticism around and I'm not sure because I apologize um, that I wasn't at the last meeting. And I also want to thank those of you who did reach out to me with um, the death of our co-founder of the Root Social Justice Center. So thank you everybody for those of you who were able to reach out with your condolences. Um, but I'm concerned about the, um, the name, the Social Justice Bureau or whatever it is that we're calling it because that's not exactly what we're doing. We're doing racial justice. And again, it's a watered down version of naming and claiming and doing what we need to do. And we keep on talking about how that needs to be focused and that is all the language throughout, which I think Evan or somebody else pointed that out in the um, comments in the draft, but yet we're still seem to be resistant 
to actually naming that and claiming it once again. So I'm asking that the name be about racial justice. I'm also asking that the data that be collected has to account to, which I think Witchy pointed out and has some comments in there around the intersectionality of our communities of color. And that, yes, it should be focused on racial data and those race points in which it intersects with different populations of how we navigate and identify. And was there something else, Aton, that was that I had nope. said as well? That that's and what I that's what I have in my head. I don't have I mean if I look through my email right now, I'd lose the meeting. Um, but that's what I had from you. Great. And the the other basic overall comment, so I want to ditto with Rebecca said. And um, the other basic comment that I wanted to make is I really would like to make this accessible to our communities. And I know that we all have a different lexicon that we choose to use when writing this stuff, including you, Aton. And, and I, I want to ask us to sort of um, use words that are, are um, accessible to more populations and a younger population, uh, maybe a reading crowd that doesn't know those sort of words that we might be using. When I was reading through drafts, there are words that I'm like, hmm, like that's interesting. It makes me pause. And even though it sounds smart and, and nice and whatever, I think that we can communicate what we're trying to say um, in different ways that makes it more accessible for the community to be able to digest and understand it. And I think the more that our communities are able to digest the information that we are um, either creating together or presenting, the more likelihood that we're going to have more and more community people who can be engaged and involved and who will want to do this work with us. Okay, thank you. Other people, other, more feedback. And by the way, also bear in mind that given that it's on SharePoint, you can go in and make your own comments and it will keep track of them. Um, so other, I mean, so far it's sounding like most of you are like really pleased with what's going on. Nobody immediately a said, Aton, you're wrong. Aton, <laughs> this is Aton, this is Sheila again. I just I just yeah. had that question that I keep on sort of asking is around um I have an extreme ignorance around what the different bureaus do in terms of where we're trying to suggest the placement of this. And I hear people talking about, oh, well, the difference of this and this and that, and wouldn't it be good here? And again, I'm not sure if I'm really fully understanding the um, complexities of like, why not? Like, what are the don't do's? Like, you definitely don't want to put it with the secretary because this completely goes against what we're trying to do. Like Rebecca was pointing out to different, um, the three different entities and so were other people. And I just, I think it's, um, I don't know, I'll just be vulnerable. I think it's been hard for me to digest where to put it sure. with being very ignorant of really the complexity and the scope of work that these entities are even doing or might be able to do. So it's, yeah. it's a little bit confusing to me. And I do like the suggestion of putting out those three places. But at the same time, um, I think that we as a group should have a little bit more direction if we feel like there are other if within those three entities, it could be compromising of our work. Thanks. Okay. I mean, the broad question has that's been coming up over and over again has had to do with the connection between various proposed bodies and their connection to things such as law enforcement, public safety, and other state apparatus that are seen as being antithetical in some ways to the project. That's been a very broad concern. I won't take it further than that. There are others who are better at that. And one of them has their hand up, and that would be Evan. Um, so I think I think what I can offer to do or attempt to do is try and um, identify some of the considerations that we thought would be important in determining 
where this place should, where this office should reside. Um, we dis, in addition to the things that Rebecca identified, such as independence and impartiality, um, we also flagged that you know this entity is probably going to need some type of financial and administrative support. Um, and there was some cons there was some suggestion that if this was part of some type of larger entity, that support might be easier to not only obtain but also protect. In other words, there would be a larger entity that might be able to advocate on behalf of the financial and personnel resources that this office might need. Um, but then there was there was also some discussion about whether or not there um, there were any uh, anything to be gained by not having this office reside um, within some branch of the governor's office and instead have it um, housed in the office of an independently elected official, which at least is my understanding about how the Secretary of State's office and the auditor's office is identified. But obviously the folks who identified those two places should feel free to correct or supplement that explanation. Um, and and I, I admit that as as the uh, as one of the people who identified the office of the director of racial equity, um, you know, that was identified mostly uh, based on it seeming to be an easy or natural fit, uh, acknowledging that some folks might disagree with that. So, for example, um, it was an and it's it is an entity that already has a connection with a larger entity, the uh, office of the administration. Um, that office is supposed to provide the administrative support um, and that and the office of racial equity already has, as previously mentioned, some data collection responsibilities. But there was a recognition that that office is potentially um, understaffed and uh, under resourced. And so as a result, uh, what I attempted to do for illustrative and discussion purposes only was to say, what if it was reconstituted into a department? So in other words, it wouldn't just be, you know, an office of a few people, but it would be beefed up, adequately resourced, adequately staffed. Um, and there is still some, and I believe there is some language in the enabling legislation that attempts to give the Office of Racial Equity some independence. Whether or not that language has done the trick obviously is a, is a point of discussion and should be investigated. Um, so that was my recollection of, of how those entities were identified. I don't recall a lot of, um, a lot of engagement um, with some of those offices to directly get their feedback, hear from them directly, do a sort of fiscal analysis and, a, and develop a real pros and cons chart. And, and some of that I think is just a, a factor of the time that we were given to complete this project by the legislature. Um, and so as a result, you know, the legislature might have to pick up where we left off and do that some, do some of that work to figure out which of those three entities really is the best one, or is there some entity that we didn't really identify yet that should be investigated further? And, and that's a real possibility. That helps, Sheila? Yeah, that helps a little bit. Um, um, I Yeah, it helps a little bit. I really like, I'm more of an affirmative person, so I do like to know what is working and what could work for what we're trying to do. And in these type of situations, I want to know, like, the crossbars. I want to know the stops. I want to know, like, what is, like, really not okay. And maybe even some other people in this room might have even more knowledge around those things too, but I, I'm okay with the response and the direction of um, moving forward. Okay. Judge Grierson. Yeah, I just, um, I, turn that thing off. I just want to pick up on what Evan said, and, and I'm wondering if, if we're getting too far ahead of ourselves in terms of trying to identify one entity that that we think is appropriate for this vehicle. I'm just wondering if if all the work that's been done to frame 
the type of what we want this entity to do, regardless of where it is. Maybe that's really the legislature needs to decide where it goes. In other words, I think we can suggest any one of these. I mean, it's hard for me to sit here and weigh the pros and cons of the auditor versus the secretary of state versus the racial equity panel. They all have components of them that I think lend themselves to carrying on this work. And maybe we're beating ourselves over the head trying to come up with an answer where we're going beyond what this committee needs to do. In other words, we should be telling the legislature the type of work that we'd like to see done, what we think needs to be done. But, you know, how are we all going to feel if if we choose A and they say, no, it's going to be B or C? I mean, I, I'm not, I just don't think we need to get hung up on mm-hmm. all of us trying to come to the same place. That's all. And we have been fairly purist in trying to answer Act 65 and those five questions, and the first of which is where the Bureau should be situated and so on. Um, But I think you're absolutely right. But I mean, both you, Judge Gerson and Evan, that the, uh, and, and Rebecca in a sense too, with the, if we put out concerns, that these are our concerns, wherever it should be situated, it needs to be independent. It needs to be supported. It needs this, it needs that. And then leave it up to the lawmakers who are in fact, in the end, lawmakers. Well, and and maybe provide the pros and cons for each of the entities that we've been discussing. And then. And we can certainly as the working group turn our attention to that. Rebecca. Um, Judge, it was it's 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 funny you you said it because it was it was what we were getting to I think last night even sort of realizing yeah. this tension of and the process of this work has been to dive into the details to then just pull back out right how prescriptive we needed to go through this process to understand bit but to realize that yeah ultimately. This is these are the calls that the legislature is positioned to make, and all we can do is is identify the the, the core principles we want wherever it's put, however they want to fund it. This is just how it is, and and maybe if we can shift along those lines, like I know we've been talking about where it should be situated, again, in the context of what are the overriding overarching principles. The, I, one of the things we've been struggling on is is. The question related to that, again, related to independence, integrity, ensuring this racial equity lens um, throughout. Sheila, you and it's about the relationship between the governing board and the permanent staff that we have identified as essentially four positions. Um, The architect, the who is it? (laughs) Who is it and who is it? Uh, On page, oh, there it is, page seven. If I get another screen, my computer's going to melt down. The architect, Um, the engineer, the analyst, the project manager. Right. We've identified as essentially permanent staff. We pull that from Connecticut's uh, approach in staffing. Um, And what we are trying, we were struggling with is, all right, if if the permanent staff of four are, are charged broadly speaking, with working with the individual government agencies to get the MOUs, to get the data, to on and on and on, the collection, the analysis. Who, how, what is their relationship with this board? Sheila, you talked about being careful that we, we identify specifically, more specifically, who should be members on it. My concern, and that's absolutely a concern, and we, and we need to, I think, be more clear, my concern is also what is, what is the relationship between that board and this group of four? What is the relationship of the board members to each other? Are they on equal partnerships? Is it that the members who are not part of government are somehow an advisory, uh, play an advisory role and that the decision makers are done by 
the different seats and sort of a different status within the boards. Um, I know where I fall on it. It certainly is something we haven't settled on. We've talked about, you know, sort of worrying about, oh my gosh, do we now have to become experts in best governance practices? How big can a board get before it becomes unworkable, right? Does, do, we, do we settle on five, nine, 50, right? Do we do subcommittees? And we just started pulling our head, again, back to Judge Pearson's point, Perhaps it's not so much our job, you know, to come up with a structure exactly, but the overarching principles. Mine has been this. We need to make sure that those members who are not of the government who sit on that board have are, are clearly equal partners. B, whoever sits on that board directs the staff of four. The permanent staff before they don't just simply advise but they're the ones who settle on the questions to be asked right the assurance that all of these sort of best practices and methods are happening so they direct the permanent staff but and and so i think though that's the question because i think we have we have definitely not settled on that okay anyone else right now I would throw in that we had um, at one point, Susanna Davis and I were talking about um, the endless proliferation of racial equity task forces that the legislature seems to create. And she uh, very wisely convened a meeting of all of the you know, representatives from all of these groups, and we were all looking at each other going, oh, look, you, how how nice. And, um, and that sort of led us to talking about why, you know, that the newly constituted Criminal Justice Council might serve as a model because they, you know, it suddenly went from 12 members, all of whom were in law enforcement, to 24 members, um, many of whom, half of whom are now uh, community members. Um, and there were some other issues we hadn't thought of. Rebecca reminded us of those and others as well. Um, and so that proposal is pretty much not, when we were talking about situating it, that proposal sort of went by the by. Jen Furpo pointed out that they're already overworked and it really wasn't going to work. On the other hand, I would still say that the model of the uh, council insofar as people are equal partners has a lot to recommend it. Evan, you had your hand up and then you took it down. Well, I, I did take it down. I was I, I did take it down, but I um, my, my my thought wasn't fully articulated in my own head, but I, I wanted to supplement, I guess, what Rebecca and what you were just saying. Um, um, because I, I have worked for a state entity that was governed by a board and that board consisted of unpaid volunteers with the exception of the chair who was a full-time state employee um, and most of the unpaid volunteers were not um, state employees they had other professions and jobs and lives uh, that they needed to attend to and an observation that i made as a result of that experience was that um, and and I should also add that the the board itself had very few mandatory statutory obligations or tasks that it needed to fulfill. Um, and and in my experience and opinion that 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 constellation of factors having unpaid volunteer part time. Uh, board members on a governing body without um, any sort of firm statutory task assigned specifically to them made it difficult to get them um, to, to get and keep them trained, educated and engaged. And so um, keeping with the theme of laying out general principles as opposed to specific recommendations, 
I would suggest that um, however this is structured, the, the board or the oversight committee um, consists of a, of a number of people, like the number itself, who are able to dedicate a sufficient number of time to this task, whether it's deciding what research questions need to be answered, um, and that they be given specific authority in order to keep them engaged. Otherwise, it we risk it becoming somewhat of a, of a hollow body that shows up once a month or once a quarter for an hour or two hours or three hours and just sort of hypothecates about what the potential problems might be and how we might want to find solutions to them, as opposed to really zeroing in on the issues that they may already have some familiarity with and, and really getting the work done. I mean, how we go about doing that, there's probably multiple ways to do it, but um, I think that I think that that that's what I would try and keep in mind in crafting any type of enabling legislation that has a governing entity. Let me. I'm a little uncomfortable, I have to say. Um, Jen Furpo, if I can ask you, how has the council been running? Jen, are you there? Uh, I'm guessing she's not. It looks like she is. Um, I was hoping to get some feedback about how the council has been going, because what I've heard so far is the antithesis of what you've been saying, Evan. And so I'm, I'm, I, I guess I'd like to hear from other people who have had other experiences with these bodies. I haven't had enough of experience with the full council to be able to do that or provide that. But I can certainly say that I have heard from a number of people that it's working quite well and those are unpaid positions. They are people who have other jobs, lives, um, and it's working very differently from what your experience it seems to have been. And so I'm just being yeah, mindful I, of that. Yeah, and I and I and I, sir, I can I can chime in a little bit on that because I also sit on the criminal justice council, and so I have okay. some experience with with multiple entities. Um, and the council was not the entity that I was referring to. I, I was working for the Natural Resources Board, which was a much smaller entity with a much smaller board. Um, right. You know, I think that there one one critical difference that I see um, between the Natural Resources Board and how its board operated versus how the Criminal Justice Council operates is that the executive director and the chair of the Criminal Justice Council has done a very, at least in my my experience since May when I joined the council, has done a pretty good job of really taking the council's work and assigning it to subcommittees on which council members must sit and participate. So for example, I'm chair of the council's rules subcommittee and we've been meeting on a weekly basis, and, and not all of the members of that committee are still employed by the state. Um, at least one of the members um, has, is, uh, I believe is, is retired um, and still shows up and participates. But by virtue of the participation in the various committees that are actually tasked with getting like real chunks of work done and having producibles that are expected of them, I think that that keeps them engaged. It almost forces them to participate, stay knowledgeable, ask questions, and be responsible for the work. Um, and 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 so that might be one way that this that this could function. But the but you know it's not clear to me how that how how that model would translate into this because I'm not a data collection guy. Um, okay. I don't really understand that. And so there might be other models where there's a board structure related to a state entity that are very successful and function very well. 
Um, the point of my previous comment was just to sort of flag some factors that I that I have identified in my experience that could lead to disengagement. Um, sure. Yeah. I, it just seems we could also use the, that model still of subcommittees. And in fact, Robin has suggested that that document is also in the SharePoint folder. Allow me to point out. I believe it's called Task Force. Um, she offered, well, Robin, why don't you tell us why you offered it? Hello, sure. Um, so this, that, that just was brainstorming in my own head and occasionally speaking out loud to other human beings um, about um, when, in one of the working groups, when we were just kind of all the people we would like to, see be involved um, and that list got really really long uh, and what I had started thinking about was a task force that we help with um, which is the human trafficking task force and how um, the task force itself is self um, um, self-selected uh, and the meetings when we had them in person um, were huge. Uh, they were in different parts of the state. Um, people who uh, just had a, an interest. May, you know, I, I, I talked about one time I was sitting next to a nun, um, and her interest in human trafficking and victims, and, and what she saw in her work. So it's it's a way to get um, people who have an interest in racial justice in the criminal and juvenile justice system um, at the table who maybe don't get those invitations um, or um, can say commit and uh, to a once a quarter meeting plus self-select for a subcommittee of, of their choosing um, because they feel that they have something to offer um, and want to, to participate. And that that task force, the way it's done um, for the human trafficking is it's got a governing, it's got a, um, a steering committee, uh, and the sub the chairs of the subcommittee sit on the steering committee, and then there's other people as well, um, and that has more to do with how what their goals are. So, you know, putting who that steering committee looks like um, could be, um, you know, however people want to do it. I didn't I didn't go that far into it, but the idea that the people um, broadly um, defined help support the work of uh, the steering committee and this entity um, by having these discussions and then also at having um, a, a two-way conversation. Um, you know, I think some of the suggestions I had was bring in somebody who is a dispatcher and see how they do their job um, mm -hmm. and so that you understand what happens, you know, so that everyone understands what happens when, when a 911 call happens. What's that screen look like? How does that decision get made? Um, and transparency about the whole criminal justice system so that we have a more informed um, citizenry used broadly um, to help ask those questions and, and, and to see how we can do better. Okay, thank you. Yep. What I'm hearing both by statement and by lack of um, disagreement with the statements is that people want this governing board to direct. They want it to direct the four figures who are the bureau or the entity or whatever we're calling it. Disagree with me if you want to, because I'm trying to get some direction for where to take the working group from Monday on. I, I don't disagree, Aton. I, I think that goes to the point of having a mandatory obligation, something concrete that it's expected to accomplish. And the reason for me chiming in right now is because I think another thing that we talked about either in the working group, this full group, or both potentially, and it's it's something it's something that I've I've raised independently uh, um, to to various legislators. Um, not necessarily related to this office, but others, is this idea of revisiting the $50 per diem. Um, yes. 
which is is uh, my recollection is that dollar figure had has not been updated in a little while and perhaps it should be revisited at some point um in order to help facilitate participation in in volunteer activities such as this new office and i believe that that's our, that was something we we were actually evan we were discussing that early on as a full panel um because both coach christie and um martin lalan tried to get more money for us for this working group and that did not make it past appropriations. Um, but I know that, I don't know, Coach, I see you, which is lovely to see you, by the way, hello. Um, and I know that Representative Lalonde is here. If you would like to talk, speak to that effort, that might be helpful. Or not. I'm thinking or not. Uh, I can just weigh in real quickly. Uh, I mean, we I have had discussion, but this was uh, during the session, so I need to uh, turn back around to uh, the chair of the Appropriations Committee, who, <clears throat> when we were dealing with this issue, uh, suggested that, yes, they need to look at this a little further. And, and I will reach out to her. Uh, this prompts me to, as a reminder, that that I needed to get back to her. So there's not a particular um, bill in at this point, but it's definitely something that is recognized not just by uh, Coach and I, but also by the appropriations chair. So hopefully we can make some progress on that. Great, thank you very much. Okay. Um, other comments, this is the time for them. Concerns, questions from anyone. Um, Aton, this is Sheila. I have a question, and it might be digressing, but it's a question that came up a little bit before when we were talking about the MOAs or MOUs. And yes. I was just kind of curious if we have an understanding of knowing if our body can um, be making up what that MOU says, regardless of what entity it is with. And I'm also, the reason why I was curious about the do's and the don'ts of each of those three entities is, is there, um, is there a need to make a difference between the MOUs because of what those different entities are able to offer? Or can an MOU that we curate go across the board to whatever entity it gets placed in? Thank you. Can I Robin or Karen? Yeah, sure. well, let me, let me um, uh, take a short stab at that. I don't know that you would want to create the MOUs, but um, it, it wouldn't necessarily change across the entities. The only thing that I've, I've said I, once before, and I just want to make sure that um, that it gets heard really well, is that whatever entity houses it can't be subject to the expungements because you want a place. So what happens is um, in the course of the criminal justice system, if I get arrested now um, and I get sentenced to um, a deferred sentence, and I successfully complete that probation, then my case gets destroyed and it gets deleted. And the cops are going to delete my arrest. Um, it's not going to be tied to my name anymore. In some databases, it'll be tied to my race and my gender, but it's not going to be tied to me. I'll be deleted um, from that database, which is good. We want this to happen. We don't want, um, you know, there's a lot of really good social policy reasons for these expungements, and we do it a lot. Um, we do it daily. Um, we're just deleting things daily. <laughs> um, but because we're deleting things daily, we're masking some of the, um, the, the disparities, right? So what if it's only white people that are getting these deferred sentences and then all of a sudden they no longer appear in the data? And you won't know that um, because the data has been deleted. Uh, so that's the part that has to really um, be clear with, with this entity that they don't do any expungements. They get the data as it happens, like monthly or whatever they agree on. Um, and that they don't have to expunge any data. 
that's that's the one thing that you really need in there. But I don't know um, that you would get anything about um, writing the MOUs for them. I, I don't know that that helps you and just probably makes life miserable for you as a committee. Does that answer anything? That was really useful. Thank you. Okay. Mark. Hey, Todd, I'm going to step back from Monica. Oh, okay. Monica. I thought Jen's hand was raised before mine. Oh, you mine. know she was. I'm but, sorry. <laughs> so let's, let's go to Jen first. Yeah. Jennifer. Thanks. Thanks, Monica. I appreciate that. Um, I really just wanted to say how much I how much I appreciate all the work that the working group has done, and in particular, I really love that this report is going to include a recommendation to the legislators that when they're trying to choose where to house all of this goodness, that they actually talk to the agencies before they make their decision. As somebody who's working for a state agency that often gets fun, fun things uh, added to our plate, I really appreciate that you guys have thought that out and, and made that recommendation. Whether they take that recommendation or not, just know that somebody out there <laughs> says, go you guys. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. <laughs> oh. Monica, do you want to go now? I mean, sure, I guess I can. Um, I was trying to respond a little bit to Sheila's question. Hopefully, what I'll say is helpful and doesn't confuse things more. But, of course, part of the conversation we've been having around the, the nuts and bolts piece of it is around the fact that data is going to be coming from different organizations. And each one of these organizations has its own sets of rules around how data needs to be shared. And so that's when we talk within um, a lot of the meetings around the agency of digital services, um, there's rules that they place on data and how data gets shared. And sometimes it's an MOU that we need to have. Sometimes it's a contract. I think one of the benefits of having the entity, because we talked about you know, pros and cons, benefits. One of the benefits, although there's also drawbacks around having the entity in the executive branch is that it helps soften some of that. Um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't meet, make it easier, but it kind of gets that barrier a little bit um, harder to get over, uh, easier to get over, so. Every entity is going to have its different um, sets of rules and MOUs and contracts and different things that are going to need to be worked out. Um, and I think that's part of what the NCJRP project is also trying uh, to work through um, to support RDAP efforts. Great. Thank you. Mark, your turn. Hey, thanks, Aton, and, and good evening to everyone. I am, um, as I'm following the conversation, it's really, really interesting to see um, where this is going. And um, I also appreciate the work uh, that's gone into this. Um, some of the questions that I was asking myself had to do with, um, you know, who's the target for the data consumption and um, what the target audience data requirements are, um, who's identifying the data sets that are going to be collected, and um, when and why the data is going to be analyzed and by whom. Um, these are some of the questions that I didn't, I'm not going to mm -hmm. sit here and ask you for the answers to all of those questions. <laughs> um, but um, but uh, it's just something, you know what I mean? It's just something because sometimes no, I get you, you want to kind of back into it. Um, yep. Uh, and um, and then the question is also, you know, is 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 the reporting required, um, and and how do yes. we ensure uh, that it's not uh, biased? Um, so those are some. I think the um, you know one question that I'll, I'll just step back and 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 if if you can allow me to come back after the answer is is if is can I ask the question? The Bureau of Racial 
practice statistics. Mm -hmm. um, the enabling statute here um, it says it's um, is to collect and analyze the data. This is the the five points. Um, right. I'm not going to read the five points, but the data related to systemic racial bias and disparities within the criminal and juvenile justice systems. So I want the question that I would like to get a response from for, from you on and, and maybe come back to you after that with a follow up if I can be permitted is 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 the scope of this work limit limited to the um the um the criminal justice the criminal and juvenile justice system I'll I'll wait that, for, I'll, I'll wait for that and if I can come back Okay Rebecca are you on that or do you want me to go or what do you want to do Oh if you want to answer I I I, I can I can also respond. No, if you're ready to talk, I'm talking all the time. Um, Mark, your last question in terms of sort of the scope of, of what we interpreted those those two systems to, to be, I think I would turn to our December 2020 report where we went through all of the discretionary decision points in those systems and then went within those points uh, highlighted priority points that we were we were we thought should be questioned. So when I when I think about those decision making points that we identified, we did not limit it to initial encounter with law enforcement, which may be where you might go. We went even broader. Um, and we were looking and you know Sheila was was a big source of pu pushing us there in terms of thinking bigger, right? Bringing in um, the education schools angle, right, and, inter and and counseling, we got into just sort of that side of it, um, and uh, certainly for the juvenile justice side as well, uh, system side in terms of who, who gets involved, who touches those discretionary decision-making points, who makes the call to report, who does that. Then we got to the other end of it, and I forget where we landed. Um, I don't know if it was expungement, if it was no longer being supervised by DOC or DCF um, on the juvenile side, um, but that's how we described those systems to be. If if I could, please, I, and I don't want to yeah, spend too much more time on this, but my I guess my question is really, is is the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics scope of work? Will the Bureau, the Bureau of Racial Justice, um, the Racial Justice Statistics, it, is their scope of work limited to the criminal justice system, or will it be? I think that's um, Rebecca. I think that's really what I was trying to say. I'm, I may have misstated. I, I may have misspoke. Mark, right now the answer is yes. Okay, but we are also mindful of the fact that there needs to be scalability built into this entire body okay. insofar as uh, other issues may come up. Mm -hmm. And you also need to be aware that there have been a significant number of legislators who are not in favor of this thing at all, precisely because it is limited to the criminal and juvenile justice systems. Okay. Um, you want, Okay, you want me to I stop? Want yeah, I wanted to um just you know I yeah I echo that you know and um you know I I, I saw this thing emerging coming out of judiciary and I, I know the work that um the both um, judiciary committees put into this and and always thought this should be broader um, just as Act 54 your enabling statute was broader um, right as a result of uh, and that was uh, the Attorney General's and the Human Rights Commission's task force report right. Although you have been a little bit um, aside from all of that, you know it's all interrelated because at the end of the day, it's about systemic racial bias, and um, and I I'd add, I'd just add to that, you know, in because you know, in a sense, you know, as much as I um, appreciate and care for um, and care for Tutana, she's kind of the oddball in the group because um, she's the only one of the thirteen of you. I think there's thirteen. Well, I guess maybe there's more now because of uh, mm -hmm. this policy. Um, she's the only one that doesn't have anything to do with the the, uh, the criminal justice system. Well, I shouldn't say nothing to do with it, but 
But interestingly, her work, and when we were in committee, when we put forward the enabling statute for her in uh, Senate Judiciary, uh, we made it. And if you look at the working papers in that committee, and it's memorialized, you'll see that we had a incredibly robust conversation about data, uh, about technology, about building out an infrastructure to support the work that she does. But just going back to um, Susanna, your enabling statute, it says that um, you, it says, quote, um, to work with agencies and departments to implement a program of continuing coordination and improvement of activities in state government order, in order to, quote, combat systemic racial disparities and measure progress toward fair and impartial governance. And it goes on and it gives a, a few things there, but one of those things is overseeing, as you know, a statewide collection of race-based data to determine the nature and scope of racial discrimination in all systems of state, so on and so forth. And, and this again, this, this policy, um, I think, well, what I guess all I'm really getting at is it seems like to me that it just makes a whole lot of sense that the racial equity executive director somewhere in that ballpark in that area that mm -hmm. this apparatus is appropriate if if not necessary not just for the criminal justice system but for all systems of state government uh the education health being one of them. right so of yeah. course i agree with your comment by saying that it, it must be scalable and just because it starts with the, the criminal justice system, we can have the tail wag the dog to um, to Rebecca's point. Uh, we, we don't want to build a system um, that is designed to address racial disparities across all systems with um, with principles uh, and um, and uh, um, and rules that would really tie us into this. Um, um, Respectfully, draconian uh, type of um, a system that is is it, do it doesn't really comport to uh, all of these other all of these other systems. And and the, the last thing I'll say is is that um, you know I heard a lot of interesting comment about the Natural Resources Board, the Criminal Justice Council, the Human Trafficking Task Force. And oddly, every single one of those, every time somebody said one of those, I cringed. Um, because they're right. all steeped in uh, this, the very same thing that we're trying uh, right. to combat here. Um, so I don't even, I think the, to again, back to Rebecca, your point is, is we don't want to build this thing on those principles. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of like these guys here telling me in Chittenden that we should build, you know, a team that's responding to a, racism as a public health emergency on a ComStat model. You know, it you know it just blows my mind. So I, I just wanted to you know to mm -hmm. note that you know in closing, there does seem to be, um, you know, a lot of talk about analysis, mm -hmm. and this goes back to those initial questions that I asked you. Uh, is what is that? What does that really mean? You know, is are we building something that's just going to enable people to kind of keep going back to? The, the source in bringing us reports, more reports, um, more reports, more reports. Um, you know, are are we are we building something where we're going to engage people? Um, we're going to we're building an apparatus where we're we're depending on folks to to interpret and synthesize data for us and tell us and come back and tell us what it means. Again, more of that, or are we building something um, that will? that we can take that is that is manual as we were talking about three and a half years ago um, that you know we identify key decision points and I love the language you incorporated high impact high discretion remember that decision points um, you know and are we are we moving toward a place where we can automate that process I mean mm -hmm. and what we're doing is we're building algorithms on the back end that, that deliver this these data to us that roll up into dashboards because mm -hmm. some of the things that we're seeing especially uh when the the agency that we're actually evaluating or the apparatus that we're actually evaluating is the deliverer of the message uh, sometimes those things don't serve us very well 
You know, whether it's the sentencing report of 2012 or the Act 64 report for incarceration rates in 2018, they didn't work out very well for us. Um, because again, the information um, was, a, a, it was, in, you know, analyzed and, it, and the report was composed, um, but there, there wasn't really a, you know, a independent algorithm that was in, in place that just delivered us the data. Right. I think, you know, especially in the criminal justice system, a lot of times the, the qualitative aspect of it is really not the leading story. Uh, it's important. Mm -hmm. But it's not the leading story. A lot of times when you went in with 338 last biennium and you were talk talking about justice reinvestment, you just needed the damn numbers, right? Okay. And, and I think that that's really one of the things that, you know, I hope you, you we're, we're focusing on when we're building this thing is, is, you know, hopefully you can build something that at some point or another, at some level or another, it's, it's basically lights out. It Mark? Is, is pulling data. Thanks. Yeah. Now, I just want you to know that there's been a whole lot of discussion. Um, we haven't even touched on it about the importance of qualitative data and qualitative analysis. That hasn't, we haven't even touched on that. I'm sorry about that. Um, no, I appreciate the time. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Rebecca. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to address some of Mark's questions so that he just, clarified here specifically hoping that you know you're looking for not seeing it yet um, details on on how the analysis is going to be done how the collection is going to be done um, to make sure because I hear you mark and I'm with you the last thing I want is more of the same it's certainly not why I'm here spending all these hours on this project um, because this is different this isn't just government data integration to understand court systems this is about understanding and addressing, correcting right, racial inequities in these systems that we know are built in to the institutions themselves. So I, I'm with you. One of the things that um, Karen and Robin um, talked about earlier when we started out this meeting, we, we went right to the nuts and bolts section. We talked about uh, the, the plan that's been being built by the NCJRP. Uh, Robin, Karen, you talked about how you going through the AISP toolkit that you saw a lot of similarities, some overriding principles. Uh, one of the things that I also did after last night's meeting, again, concerned with exactly what Mark is asking, how are we doing this different precisely? Um, with this tension that Judge Mearson's brought up, Monica brought up last night, Evan, all of us, this tension we're trying to do, which is to not be overly prescriptive or even too prescriptive, this tension, but yet not vague, so vague as to leave a vacuum for people to just inject what they think, again, what they think being the risk of more of the same, right? More of the same embedded uh, emphasis of, of just inheriting the problem. So here's what I did. I, I didn't get to share this earlier this meeting. This didn't come out last night, but on this shared point, my work today was also to go through the AISP toolkit. And when you go through that, there are sort of these beautifully set out columns. Positive, yes. I think, positive practices. Positive and practices and, and then. Bad. And they, bad practices. Not negative, but yeah. <laughs> and, and, and what I realized was what, what, what we spent a lot of time talking about last night was, the, was part four. The nuts and bolts. What was left unfilled, I thought, in our report and was the best methods, right? Um, and that's page 12. And what I just wanted to, to just as an exercise, I went through each of those columns on the AISP toolkit, best practices for data collection, best practices for algorithms, best practices for analysis, best practices for reporting, those things that you've just addressed, Mark. Um, and I, for what it's worth, not to, that I, I suggest we wanna be that proscriptive in this report, right? Because we could debate forever uh, whether we agree with this or not. But I think this gives us here in this meeting, page 12 to 13, A, B, C, I just pulled out those sections, how different the approaches from what I saw from the plan 
um, discussed last night from the NCJRP's work, right? Where this is, is getting to where Mark is, is going, which is how do we make sure that it's not just the qualitative data, but how do you go about it? How is it that how, mm -hmm. disaggregating the data um, to make sure that the individuals and people represented by the data are not rendered invisible, that, that our small population and small samples don't render these people individuals again invisible right how do we do this how do we how do we get that input anyways i thought it was an exercise that made me realize whether we want to put this much in or not to the report i think we have to be clear that the ais tool p toolkit is our guiding um principle yes. unless there are other sources that people here collectively can share mark i'm i'm also going to point to you of that to share where we should be looking at best practices, standards. I know Abby Crocker I started uh, I connected with today and she shared some um, ethical uh, ethics st standards for this data meth methodology work. You know Karen and and um, Robin have shared uh, best standards. Um, we can look at I think they said it specifically the CFRs um, there. But I would just encourage. Think, yeah, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to finish and just say I, I just encourage people to share other other resources we can look to in terms of getting because it, it is this is we we can't we don't we don't see much out there besides the ISP toolkit with this yeah. sort of dedicated focus of unpackaging racial bias in, in this methodology, this work. Karen. Oh, gotta get myself off mute. Um, so I completely agree about the racial equity toolkit. I think that is an incredible piece of work. I think the piece that's missing, and this is why I mentioned the introduction to data sharing and integration, which was also done by AISP, is the foundational work that has to go into building the system that allows you to share the data. So I would really encourage you all to look at that piece of work that AISP did. It's um, longer than the NCJRP and much less, um, uh, much less, um, oh, I forget what we call those words, but anyways, it's, um, it's an easy read. And I think it's really, really understandable for people who don't understand the process around data sharing and integration. I think it's well worth the read. And I think it's the foundational work that has to happen before we get to the racial equity toolkit. The one thing I want to say about the NCJRP is that work is going to go forward regardless to lay the foundation of data sharing and integration. It's it's what we have in process already. Um, DPS is going to be getting a contract with the Arnold Ventures to hire a person from ADS to help us work through all the data sharing agreements, which you guys are all going to need. I mean, they can be data sharing agreements that are shared. The, the issue I see, um, you know, so you guys don't ever have to engage with NCJRP. RDAP doesn't ever have to engage. Um, you can reap the benefits in the end because we'll have created those data sharing agreements. The benefit you get to being involved with NCJRP is you get to influence the process. And I think that's a huge piece that I think I haven't I haven't stated that clearly at this mm -hmm. point. But but I think you get to influence the work by being engaged with NCJRP because it's going to happen anyways. So you might as well be a part of it and benefit from it. Um, and you don't have to, but I'm just putting that out there that you you have the opportunity to be influential in this. And again, I, I would really suggest that you look at the um, introduction to data sharing and integration the AISP put together because it's longer, but it's much less buzzwords is what I was looking for. It's much less buzzwordy. It's very easy to read. And I think it kind of matches what you see in NCJRP. And I think like Julio said last night, NCJRP's write-up is nothing unusual. It's very similar to what he's seen other organizations and other states do when they're looking to, to share data and to integrate data. 
that's all I have. Thanks. Okay. Uh, hey, Tom, can I, can I just, I left one thing hanging and I, I didn't really uh, stress it. Um, is, is that- Make it short uh, if you would, please, Barb. Of course. Um, I'm, I just want to strongly advocate that the group would consider um, the fact that given the responsibility of data uh, as it pertains to systemic racial bias and disparities, that this, um, that this um, apparatus be squarely placed in the Office of the Racial Equity Executive Director and or the that um, that component of state government. And I think that um, the the I think the most important part of that recommendation is is just as we suggested from the onset of the creation of that office uh, that you would uh, request that, that office be made uh, independent, that it would be pulled from the executive agency and that it would be made an independent agency, much like the HRC. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we've got a lot of marching orders for the working group, um, which feels good actually. Um, Ian, I hope, I look forward to your notes, Ian. <laughs> There's a lot of them this time, sir. I'm sure there's a lot of them. I'm really looking forward to them because I'm going to need to organize my thoughts very carefully before Monday's meeting. Um, is there anything else anyone has to add? We have, um, we've got a lot. I mean, it's good, um, but this is, of course, the time to do it. So I don't want to cut anyone off. We have 20 minutes, um, but... There's a lot here. Okay. I am not seeing any hands, so I'm going to move us along. Thank you all enormously for this conversation. I mean, like, really enormously, each and every one of you, guests, as well as working group members, as well as regular panel members, as well as legislators. This has been extremely helpful in getting us closer to the goal. And it makes me feel like we're a lot closer than I thought we were even. And uh, I'd like to just remind us when we first got this assignment back in, I don't remember the summer, we were all a little terrified. So I'm really proud of us that uh, we've moved on and have gotten this much done. So our next meeting is, I don't know, who has their calendar out? I've got to find mine. The 9th of November. Oh, Coach, okay. Coach? Coach, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, thank you all. I, I just want to reiterate uh, what uh, Aton, you know, said. This this is a labor, uh, and it's a labor of commitment. And I I just am just so proud of this group, and and I really mean that from the bottom of my heart. And before before we uh, jump off, I'd like to share something that came to me a few days ago. Uh, which is a quote from Congressman John Lewis. And I think it speaks, it speaks d directly to what Eton, Eton was talking about. The quote, little by little, day by day, what's meant for you will come its way. Just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening, Coach. And everybody else, have a good evening. Again, thank you. Working group, I will see you Monday. Everybody, please check out the documents on SharePoint and get active. Um, um, and I will speak with the working group on Monday and the rest of you next month, if not before. Be well. Good night. Thank you, Aton. Thank you. Night, everybody. Thanks, Aton.
welcome.